started here shortly. All right. <laughs> you can do coffee just now. David, David, they um, get uh, Christmas in the trail. Okay. What about the rest of the trail? Dunkin' Donuts. It's Southern. Oh, Southern. Southern in the yeah. trip take my hands. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Southern. It's on the uh, north and west side. Uh, it's quite a large Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, they have a nice table there to sit down and talk. Okay. Let them talk. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. Um, we're going to start door knocking in the beginning of September. Um, I've been doing some work on creating a soul winning plan uh, and uh, work on some uh, new um, track invites for the open house meet and greet. The open house meet and greet is tentatively scheduled for October 2nd at the Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, conference room. We'll be doing the same presentation uh, and I uh, have not got a confirmation from them. If the room is available at the 6.30 time, I will call them on Monday to confirm uh, for October 2nd. Uh, if you can be there, the intention behind a, a meet and greet is for those people who we've spent uh, the time to uh, evangelize to in the community to come uh, at the Chamber of Commerce, uh, as opposed to the church meeting hall here, to get to know more about who we are and our intentions, and of course to spread the gospel, give a little history about uh, this church and Baptist in general. Um, so that's scheduled for October 2nd, uh, tentatively provided that uh, the Chamber of Commerce has nothing going on that, uh, I believe it's a Monday or Tuesday evening, I can't remember for sure, but I remember. What time? It's a Monday? What time? 6.30. 6.30? Uh, I figured to give people enough time to, to get uh, themselves situated on a Monday. Um, prayerfully, we uh, have a, a more substantial turnout this time, uh, especially since the uh, plan for the door knocking could be uh, a lot more uh, aggressively engaging uh, people uh, for soul winning. Uh, and there was something else I wanted to share with you all. Uh, so please keep my son in your prayers. He's uh, had a bit of a call. Uh, also wanted to give Walter his birthday present from the McCullen. Happy birthday. Uh, Ian I have to sign it for you in his unique way. Uh, Jonathan should be here shortly. He's getting his tire uh, patch to replace. Uh, I think that's it for church announcements at this point. Uh, so if you don't bow your heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you immensely for the opportunity to come together and worship under you to hear your word, to edify saints, to grow. Lord, we ask that you put your blessing upon those who are ill and not with us today. I ask that you continue to raise up the McGibberies. They have been an instrumental part of this church. You're helping us with our previous concert, providing us with uh, the church piano and of course, spiritual support. We ask that you're with Cindy Desolate as she is settling into her new home and strengthen her heart, knowing that she is going to be blessed by her faith, through her faithfulness to you. Lord, I ask that you continue healing with my mother. She is on the road to recovery. 
I ask for continued healing of Larry Haroon, who is still recovering from his heart attack. Mike Cargrove, who is coming out of uh, cancer surgery and chemotherapy. His spirits are strong. We know that's because of your work, Lord. Lord, we ask for your continued blessing upon this church. We ask that you're here with us today and you guide the words, guide your pastor to this tiny church. Humble me, Lord, in your presence. Your word is clear and your word convicts and turns hearts. We turn the service into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to continue through uh, Genesis. I'm hoping that we can complete this in three more sessions. Um, we are now in chapter 37. And uh, I had aspirations to finish this uh, in, in one sermon, but I believe that it would, it would uh, hold us up too long. I want you to please take notes specifically on how Joseph, coat of many colors, parallels Jesus. You're going to see some key points. Um, Arthur Pink actually has discovered over a hundred ways that the story about Joseph, coat of many colors, has um, given a prelude to our Lord. Without any further ado, chapter 37, verse 1, and I'll read it. Through two, and Jacob dwelt in the land wherein the father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. There are the generations of Jacob, Joseph, being seventeen years old, and was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Zilah, and with the sons of Zilbah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought unto his father evil reports. Uh, we have the tenth Toledot. These are the generations of Jacob. Again, to remind you that these are the books of Moses, and each of the Toledots are a collective of the generations that Moses had, had believed to have edited uh, in order to give him the credit for the first five books. Um, Seventeen is, is the peaking point of manhood. He's charged with the flock. Joseph uh, is considered well to do, uh, and Joseph was con candid on, on how things went down. You see, the last uh, sentence of verse 2, where he's uh, confessing to his father an evil report, has led people to believe it was a tattletale. Um, that is a, an error. He was merely expressing what he had witnessed to his father. Joseph was naive. He didn't intend to... Uh, express ill will of his brothers. He was just expressing what he had witnessed. We see this a lot with people today. I know people that just state things matter-of-factly and not intending any ill will towards somebody else. So he was not he was not uh, conspiring against his brothers. If you would. In verse three. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age and made him a coat of many colors. The unique coat likely to have sleeves. This is one of the things that I've discovered is that most of the coats at the time were sleeveless. Um, and in this instance, uh, it was likely to have sleeves. That's what made it so unique. Uh, they were uh, not commonly made in that way. It was highly ornamented. It also shows a comparison the previous mischief of his father with Isaac. Be mindful of the follies of favoritism. Okay? This is what we're seeing here. Uh, and it's not upon Joseph, the, meaning Joseph's not expressing the, the follies of the, the forefathers. It's his father, uh, Jacob, that's uh, stumbled. In verse 4 through 8, And when his brethren saw their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably about unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet even the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed, for behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheep arose, and those stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about, and made obeisance to my sheep, and his brethren said unto him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? 
or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. This boy was zealous about his gifts. The, the, the dreams that he had, he was zealous about. It, again, he is not intending to impose anything upon anyone. He is naively expressing this gift of his dream without cause of what's going on around him. Verse 9. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it to his brethren and said, Behold, I have a dream, a dream, a dream, born. and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Thank you. And behold, he told his father and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come bow down ourselves to thee on, to the earth? And his brethren envied him. But his father observed the same. Now, eleven leaders rule, who rule over Jacob and his brothers would, would submit to Joseph. This is what the suggestion is. Don't forget the parallel in Revelation 12. Um, we spoke about that in the uh, uh, sermon on, on uh, the sermon series on Apocalypse. Now, however, at the end here, you have Jacob, although he's dismayed about the dream, he took heart. He said, the scripture says, observing the same. He took a moment to reflect on what he just heard. He didn't just dismiss it. He took the time. Knew in his heart that something significant had just occurred. His son doesn't willfully wish ill upon anyone. His son was acting naively, if you would. Again, it's not that he had any intention behind his, his expressing in the dream. He's just very matter of fact. Verse 12. And his brother went in to feed their father's flock in Shechem. Shechem is about 15 miles uh, between Iran. This distance is very key. This is the shepherding field, 15 miles of where they have to trek. Do you understand as we get further into the text why this length of space is so important? Verse 13 through 18, And Israel said unto Joseph, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will see thee unto them. And he said unto him, Here I am. And he said unto him, Go, I pray thee, see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with his flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And certain men found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the men asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray, where are they feed their flocks? And the man they are departed, and the man said, They are departed hence. For I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when he saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. That's a lot more than a simple brotherly jealousy. A lot more. I would say they were really fearful of his leadership. Who is this boy going to lead us? Sounds awfully familiar. I want to make a take a second to you to point out. Here's a correlation. Remember, I told you to take notes at the beginning of this message. Who was it that was against Jesus Christ? Who sought to slay him? His brethren. Verse 19. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit, and we will say, Some evil beast hath devoured him, and we shall see what will come, become of his dream. And Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands, and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into that pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands and deliver him to his father again. 
Another interesting parallel. Reuben's attempting to save Joseph's life. Now granted, again, we're seeing a parallel here of, of uh, a uh, Roman who uh, washed his hands uh, some years later. Verse 23 and 24 Okay, we read that 20, uh, okay. And it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they had stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him and cast him into the pit, and the pit was empty, there was no water in it. See, the, the pits were actually cisterns. Understanding this is a very arid climate. So throughout the, the area, the region of Shechem and Hebron, well, the herders, they developed these cisterns. They're pots in the ground that were, were being filled with water. They were very large to accommodate. So they were tending on putting him in this empty cistern. Verse 25, And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes, and looked, and behold, the company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spicery and balm and myrrh going to carry it down to Egypt. What do we use what did they use, the, the Egyptians use uh, these spiceries for? Embalming, right? Mummifying, right? But what did they put on Jesus when they wrapped him and put him in the tomb? Right? We're seeing more similarities, right? The Ishmaelites, uh, this is a generalization. These people weren't technically Ish Ishmaelites. Uh, uh, they, had, they were not actually the children of Hagar. Uh, it's kind of like saying, uh, Muslim, uh, when you're, you're talking about covering the entire Middle Eastern culture. These were not specifically Ishmaelites, just so you were aware of that. They did not come from Hagar. Verse 26, And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is that we slay our brother and conceal his blood? The love of money. You don't want to get paid. Verse 27, Come and let us see him, that you sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh, and his brethren were content. Okay. So what we've just witnessed here is we have coins or lots for vesture. Preeminent in all things, if you're uh, questioning the, the 20 or 30 pieces of silver. Okay. So, again, Christ would be the greater of it. Make sense the difference between the 20 and 30 pieces of silver? Betraying brethren. Given up to the hands of another. Parallels Jacob and Rebekah, mischief and thievery, coat dipped in blood, alludes to Christ's return. Right? Remember in Revelation, we're talking about Christ's return and he's coming on a white horse and his cloak was dipped in blood. Verse 28. And they passed by the Midianites, the merchantmen, and they drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph out of the pit uh, to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought Joseph into Egypt. And Reuben returned into the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and they rent his clothes and returned unto his brethren and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid to the goats and dipped the coat in blood. And they sent the coat of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. And the evil beast had devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent his pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon him and his loins and mourned his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son's mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And the Midianites sold him into Egypt unto Potiphar, an officer of the Pharaoh's captain of the guard. There's an argument regarding the word grave in the text. As it being held, remember the men who were commissioned to preserve the word ordained by God. Grave is correct. Grave in the Noah Webster means 
properly pressing heaviness, solemn, somber, serious, showing being weighted. Jacob said he would mourn Joseph seriously. He didn't say he was going down to town. Okay, this is a common misconception. People are, are attempting to draw upon text and, and make the correlation between grave and hell. That's not the case here. Verse 30, chapter 38 and verse 1 through 7. And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned into the certain Adolamite whose name was Harah. And Judah saw there was a daughter of a certain Canaanite. Now I have to give you a stop for just a second. Chapter 38 kind of steps away from the story a little bit. We've just taken a break from Joseph. There's a reason why. We're going to get it today. Um, and Judah saw there was a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went into, into her, and she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Ur. Keep in mind what that means. And she conceived again and bare a son, and she called his name Onan. And she yet again conceived and bare a son and called his name Shalah. And he was at Chizib when she bare him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name is Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. That happened quick. Real quick. How wicked was he? Judah, first of all, chasing pagan women. Bad, bad news. Why do pagan women tempt so well? Because they present themselves in lascivious ways. Moreover, they fulfill, moreover, they fulfill the promise of, of, of thereof. They don't just look like bad women. They really are bad women. They look like harlots. They act like them. And this time, we clearly have both men and women who are be behaving lasciviously in these matters. Talking about now. This is biblical times where we're, we're seeing in the text where these women are, are behaving this matter, but men and women do this to this day. Both men and women are born. Let's just put that out there very clearly. It's disgusting. Now, Ur did err in some way, and he caught the eye of God, and God slew him. And, and, and it's just so matter of fact in the text, Judah's firstborn was wicked in the sight of the Lord. How wicked was he? Then? That's pretty bad. He wasn't even around that long. Long enough to really get the, the rage of God, that's for sure. Verse 8, And unto Judah said, Oh, then go into thy brother's wife and marry her and raise her up seed by thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass when he went into his father's wives that he spilled it on the ground unless they should give seed to his brother. And the thing that he did displeased the Lord. Wherefore he slew him also. There's a concern regarding this particular passage in the church today with birth control. That's what we are witnessing today. When you read this text, there's a concern about birth control. God killing someone for not procreating and, and, and doing what we call commonly as a rhythm now. I don't know if I can, I can hold to that to this day. We're talking about a time when it was necessary to procreate massively. And, and of course, God was very specific about being fruitful and multiplying because he wanted the line to grow. Did we have a problem with that today? Um, and, I, and I can do a whole sermon on to why God is not going to kill you for using birth control in a covenantal marriage. Outside of covenantal marriage, if you're using birth control, you're fornicating. Let's just be very honest about that. You're fornicating. You're committing a sin. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But with inside of covenantal marriage, I don't think God's going to kill you. Um, but again, we can do a whole sermon on that. I, I do have another full chapter to go through. Um, and we were in verse 11. And Judah said to, then Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, 
remember that. Remain a widow at the father's house till Shalah, my son, be grown. For he said, lest peradventure he die also. And his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelled in his father's house. And in process of time, the daughter of Shuah, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and sent unto his sheepers, sheep shearers to Timnath and said his friend Terah the Amulite. And it, it was told to Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father in law goeth up to Timnath to shear the sheep. Sheep shearing is like a party for at that time. They all got together to shear the sheep and they celebrate. Judah went sheep shearing. But that's not what his intent was. I, I, I dare to use this expression, but what happens during a sheep shearing stays in sheep shearing. Ju Ju Judah was seeking something more than just party. Verse 19, uh, excuse me, we were uh, in verse 14. And, and she put her widow's garments off of her. Put her widow's garments off of her and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place which is by the way of Timnath. And she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given unto him to, to wife. She has intentions as well. When Judah saw her and, and thought to her to be a harlot, because she had covered her face, he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come unto thee. And she knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. That's trouble. And she said, What wilt thou give me, if thou mayest come unto me? She's conniving. And said, and he said, I will send thee a kid from my flock. And she said, Wilt thou give me pledge till thou send it? She's a smart woman, real smart. And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet. Generally a ring. It's a sign that they use to mark usually letters or sealing of, of scrolls, like we talked about in Revelations, uh, excuse me, Revelation, um, and it's intended to be an image of the house of Judah. And bracelets, and they staff that is thine in thy hand, and he gave it to her, and came unto her, and she conceived by him. And she rose and went away, and laid by her veil for her, and put on her garments of widowhood. Prostitution and conspiracy. Wicked, wicked. And Judah sent a kid in the hand of his friend, the Adamite, and to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he found her not. Then he asked the men of the place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And all the men of the place, they were was no harlot in this place. Sneaky, devious. And Judah said, Let her take it to her, and let's be shamed. Behold, I sent this kid, thou hast not found her. And it came to pass about three months after that it was told to Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot also behold she is with child by whoredom and Judah said bring her forth and let her be burned now in this time the adulteresses were burned on both sides both by Israelites and those who were pagans they both performed this practice um, they were pretty serious about this this is this is serious business adultery this is a very grievous sin amongst not only people, but to God. Otherwise, Christ wouldn't have stated very clearly that that's the only grounds for dismissal of the covenant of marriage. Now, we're in 25. When she brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are am I with child. And she said, Discern. I pray thee, whose are these, the signet and bracelet and staff? And Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I, because that I have given her not to Shalab, my son, and he knew her again no more. Judah felt foolish in the presence of Tamar. She got him. 
No good thing at all happened here. None. Nothing. Judah fornicated with his daughter-in-law. The point here is that we're not going to see any changes. Sin is within our flesh. The only way that that does change is because of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 27, it came to pass in the time of her travail that behold, twins were born in her womb. And it came to pass when she travailed that one of them put out his hand and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread saying, this came out first. And it came to pass that he drew back his hand that he behold his brother came out and she said, how hast thou broken forth this breach be upon thee before his name was for us and after came out his brother, and that he had the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name is Zarah. Interesting. These are the lines from Judah with Tamar. Well, this is a very strange break in the story of Joseph. Zarah and Zarah, we're going to talk about later. Now, this break isn't so much of a break, and I'm going to say, tell you why. The enemy's at work to thwart the coming of Christ. That's what we're seeing here. This break is intended to show the enemy trying to prevent the coming of our Lord. Something I, I come across is in, in the, this text in, in chapter 38, in the Hebrew text, there's 48 letter intervals that are going to be very fascinating. Uh, and they're, they're going backwards to the text, and they spell out a few names. 49 intervals, follow me here. You have Boaz, 49 intervals, each one of those letters spell out Boaz. Then Ruth, 49 letter intervals spell out Ruth. Obed, 49 intervals spell out Obed, their child. Yeshe or Jesse, 49 letter intervals spell out his name. And this is in this chapter, 38. And then David. Now they are written backwards. The in initial binding of this was in the book of Esther, this 49 letter interval system. Uh, that backwards motion is intended to thwart the hand of God. Incidentally, that's what we're seeing here, chapter 38. They're intending to thwart the lineage of Christ. But it's just fascinating to see that in the Hebrew text. What I'm getting at is that Scripture, without a doubt, is the work of the, of the hand of God. God's plan is intricate, detailed, beyond brilliant of our own understanding. Satan shows a lot more uh, of his plan in this case. And when you see these things in your life that are not a direct result of your sins, be mindful where it's coming from. You see, when we're acting out in our own sins of our own flesh, judgment is pretty instant. We see those circumstances come upon ourselves. If we make a mistake, we know. In fact, the Holy Spirit gives us a very special gift. It's called conscience. That conscience bears weight on the believer. When a lie exits your mouth, you know it. So when we see these things in our life, know that if these circumstances are outside of our sins, the enemy is afoot. Make no mistake, Lucifer is real. He will do all he can to thwart the work of Jesus Christ. We do have great opposition. We, the elect of God, must go out into the world with the gospel. We fight upon our knees before the Lord and in the field by reaping the harvest that's commanded by the husband, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All of this is in his name. I just had a conversation with uh, one of our peripheral members regarding circumstances in their life. And they called me up and they wanted to know, what are they doing wrong? Why is God punishing me? God's not punishing that person. 
the, when you're, in, you're, you're experiencing some kind of turmoil, tribulation in your life, and it's a direct result of your sin, you know it. If it is something that's completely out of your realm, there are supernatural forces at work. This is real. We're not talking about some kind of made up fictitious game. The enemy is really at work. So I'll give you an example. Uh, probably about a year ago, I had, uh, had to go to the hard time and everybody had left the house. I didn't have a ride. So I took it upon myself, knowing full well that I, my, my cognitive skills of riding a motorcycle were done. I had no ability, I should never have been on the bike. So I'm on my way to go to the heart doctor. And not even a block away from my house, I'm making a left hand turn on the stately. And I clipped my foot on the curb. That's just stupid. Anybody who rides a motorcycle knows that that's really stupid because the lane is this wide, I could have easily got my motorcycle in there, no problem. But my mind and my ability to coordinate was in no means that in the ability to function properly. And I clipped my foot on the curb. And to this day, I have a ball bruise in my left foot to remind me how stupid I was. That sin I committed against everyone in my life, that I endangered myself, and my life affects many people. It was an instant judgment. Now, there are many circumstances in my life that are not instant judgments, that are unusual circumstances that surround my life, especially being the pastor of a tiny church, intending on growing, intending on spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. The enemy can work hard to slow that road from Mysterious things happening to my car, just not, you know, uh, the air condition just not working. Financial issues that just all of a sudden, here you are, you're the major burden. Plumbing repair, all of a sudden you have this major issue. It's out of my control. I have nothing to do with these things. The things that you have direct control over in your life, something happens. It's a result of your sins. It's a result of your sins. Own it. Ask the Lord for forgiveness. Give you guidance so you can move on in your life and grow from that mistake. Now, if it's the enemy at work, how do you fight that? Prayer. A lot of it. Jesus Christ is our sword. Jesus Christ is our shield. Thank God he's on my side. So that's the reason why this interlude comes in here. Chapter 38 is a break from the story of Joseph. Thwarting God's plan. We've had a lot of unusual experiences in this little church. A lot. Great stories we can spend hours talking about all the things that have occurred from the time it was originally a biker ministry to now. Chapter 39, we're going to read through verse 8. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar and the officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, Egyptian, brought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph. You're going to hear that a lot. And he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of the master master the Egyptian and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did prosper in his hand and Joseph found grace in his sight and he served him and he made him overseer of his house and all that he had and put into his hand and it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer of the house and over all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake and the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field and he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not all he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was good, a goodly person, and well favored. And it came to pass after these things, that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, 
And she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master, what if not what is with me in the house? He hath committed all that he hath in my hand. A couple of things we need to be aware of here because there's a lot of commentaries out there. You're going to hear a lot of pastors talk on this particular subject. I need to make it very clear. Joseph was a slave. You're wondering why Joseph was hanging around with Potiphar's wife? Probably because it was his job. He was in the house, not because he was interested in her. The other thing you need to be aware of is that he learned something. After all these years of adultery in his family line, he learned something. There's a small theory that uh, is debunked here. Uh, Potiphar was a eunuch. There's another little story going around. Yes. Oh, yeah. Potiphar was a eunuch. This is why his wife has wandering eyes. No, she was just a heathen. That's all she was. She was a wicked Egyptian heathen. That's it. Now, let me give you some understanding of the context of the words using in Scripture. You can't be a wife if your husband's a eunuch. And I'm going to tell you why. Because wife connotates consummation of marriage. The way it works in text in this Bible that we love so much is that once the marriage is completed, it is completed with consummation. All the text leading up to this point and continuing on all state the same thing. Man and woman consummate marriage. So for her title to be wife, there had been something happening on that wedding night. Not a unit. But again, I discovered this and you will probably too. And again, I have to, as your pastor, to be able to give you that information so that when you see it, that's a little weird. Now, verse 9. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Potiphar is the chief executioner, possibly... Susanus in the early 1000 BC, that's the 21st dynasty. Uh, here's a man who truly understood adultery. We're talking about Joseph now. Joseph understood adultery, very understood, very clear. Everything in his past, he knows from his, his father's father, all the way down the line of adultery. And he knows this sin is against one another, but more importantly, it's a sin against God. Covenant is serious. This is not some kind of trivial little thing. That here, here's what's happened in our society today. Marriage is a joke. But so much so that they, they've redefined it. I can just, you know, hang out with somebody for a little while, maybe have a couple of kids, and then just end it. I don't like it anymore. I'm going to go find somebody else. Yeah, you know, I'm satisfied. I'm going to find somebody else. You know, there is there is merit to some of those words that we hear in a marriage ceremony for richer, for poor, for better, for worse, for sickness and health, until death do us part. There's merit to those words. Covenant is serious business. This is not a joke. And you're making a promise to God if you're including God in this Scripture is very particular about making promises to God. He said, don't do it unless you really mean it. So, Joseph understood that. He wasn't hanging around Potiphar's wife because he had any interest in her. And yes, we know that apparently there was a tremendous amount of attraction there. Joseph was a handsome guy. Probably caused a lot of jealousy amongst his brothers, too. They knew that he was going to end up being somebody special. Somebody was going to like him a lot more than they. It, it was a lot of things about Joseph that caused a lot of turmoil. And his looks were one of them. I'm going to read through 19. And it came to pass that she spake to Joseph day by day that 
he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. He's working there. And there's none of the men of the house that were within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment with her and fled and, and got him out. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, she called unto the men of the house and spake unto him, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto this house to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass, when he had heard that I had lifted up my voice and cried, that he had left his garment with me, and fled, and got, got him out. And she laid up his garments by her until his, until his, his Lord came home. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant, which thou hast brought unto us, came unto me to mock me. And it came to pass, as I had lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled out. And it came to pass, when the master heard these words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After the matter did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. A couple of things you need to be aware of. Um, there is uh, concern about Joseph being naked. Possible. The you have to uh, understand the attire of Egyptians. Joseph running from that house, and, and she had grabbed his garment. Doesn't say cloak. Doesn't say he was naked either. Again, this is a very important. Uh, aspect because there's you have to understand what their attire was at the time uh, when they use the term girding that means that they've taken the bottom of their their hem of their their cloak and they've tucked it up so that they can run they pull it through their belt so that now they're not stumbling upon themselves so they gird up so that they can move around and do their work it's likely that that's how he was attired it, it's, he's working He's about his business, so it's, the garment that he was wearing might have been more so than just this tunic kind of thing that was girded up upon him. There might have been something else he was wearing, perhaps an overcoat or something. But it'd be kind of difficult for her to grab a hold of that and take it off. I don't know, but again, there's a lot of speculation, and it's really not that necessary to get yourself wrapped up whether or not Joseph ran out of the house. The point is, he left. He didn't commit adultery. Uh, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on whether or not Joseph was naked. It, kind of, it doesn't really add value to what it transpired. What it is of value is that you have a temptress who's lied multiple times about the situation and the fact that Joseph refrained. Joseph remained faithful to God. That's what's important, not so much whether his name. Now, the other thing I want to point out is it's likely, it's likely Potiphar knew that his wife lied. Now, this is, I'm just pre presenting a presupposition. It's, this is not written in text. But I'm giving you this idea because how kind he was to Joseph. He could have done worse. This man... He's going to lie down with his wife. He could just kill him. Because we're talking about Egypt. We're not talking about, you know, a godly nation. These are, these are real hardcore heathens. He could have just killed them. Put them in oil, done all kinds of things. Crucified them, any number of things. But he didn't. Verse 20. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison. He didn't kill him. A place where the king's prisoners were bound. King's prison. Not prisoners of state. They were specific king's prison. And he was there in the prison. And the Lord was with him. The Lord was with Joseph. And showed him mercy. And gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did, he was the doer of it. And the keeper of the prison look not to anything that was under his hand because he because the Lord was with him again 
and that which he did, the Lord made it prosper. God blessed Joseph in multiple ways, despite all the enemy's attempts to thwart God, this history, his story, and we cannot help but be marveled at the hand of God. When life appears to be tossing all kinds of madness your way, we often say, why is this happening? We should immediately know that it's not of our, of our hand, meaning something we did or out of our own sins, and it surely is not of God. God cannot do ill will to his children. That is the work of the enemy. And if we immediately recognize this and go to God in prayer, praising God for all he does, remaining obedient and faithful like Joseph, God will reward and bless us like Joseph. And I'll testify in the face of the devil. I've been on my knees before the throne of Jesus Christ and the spirit of peace came upon me. And that's blessing enough that I even have that. We forget who we are sometimes. What a wretched sinners we are. And even the blessing of being given peace in this situation, knowing that I have a prophet God that's in complete control. There is nothing that is not within his grasp. His hand does not black short. You don't realize that contentment from him can carry us through the depths of the furnace unharmed. Not a hair will be touched, amen. This concludes part one of Joseph's coat of many colors. We'll continue to chapter 40. Hopefully we'll be able to gain ground in three chapters, possibly four, God willing. Uh, you all bow your heads in prayer with me. Lord, we thank you for the message of faith. Our commitment to you, Lord, needs to be above everything in our lives. We submit everything to you, Lord. There is nothing in our lives that is with it, without your grasp. You have complete control over all things in our life. We worry for nothing in your hands. And we praise you all the way. If we be served up to imprisonment, preaching the gospel. In your name be that glory. Paul says that we are sheep counted in slaughter. If we are already victorious through your Son, Jesus Christ, who overcame the grave. Lord, I thank you for this time to be with brothers and sisters. I thank you for your message. And I pray that it turns hearts to you. In your son's name, Jesus Christ.